deserts cover more than a fifth of the world's land area. A desert is simply a place that receives less than 25 centimeters or 10 inches of precipitation a year. By this definition, Antarctica is the world's largest polar desert, followed closely by the Arctic polar desert. At almost half the size, the Sahara is the largest hot desert in the world. It is over four times larger than the second biggest desert, the Arabian Desert. Though it wasn't always this way. As many of you may know, the Sahara was once a very different place. Climate is anything but stable and this region has fluctuated drastically throughout prehistoric and even historic times. Hominins have lived in what is now the Sahara Desert for about as long as they have existed. Sahelanthropus chadensis was found on the surface in northern Chad. Though it is unknown if this species in particular were the ancestors of later hominins, it is clear that this region was important to the evolution of hominids in general. The region is not extremely well understood in regards to early human evolution, though later fossils of our own species have been found. In fact, some of the oldest fossils attributed to our species have been found in the northern bounds of the Sahara. At Jebel Irhud, 300,000 year old remains of early Homo sapiens have been found. Jebel Irhud is located close enough to the coast that this area is even habitable today. The coastal lands surrounding the Sahara Desert were habitable for hundreds of thousands of years. The Atyrian stone industry found in North Africa made some of the first tank points ever made. These points were very advanced for their time and may have been attached to lighter weaponry such as javelins or darts. Other aspects of their technology was among the most complex of the time. This culture may have influenced others, though it would eventually fade away. North Africa would have been habitable even during quite dry periods, though of course inland this was not always the case. During glacial periods, the Sahara was much drier than in interglacial periods. Though many are familiar with the concept of the Ice Age, many do not know that we are currently still in the Ice Age. The Ice Age is just any period when the Earth has significant glaciers covering it. Our planet has been in an Ice Age for the past 2.5 million years. Within an ice age are warmer and cooler periods, respectively called interglacial and glacial periods. As you may have guessed, we are currently in a warmer interglacial period. The last glacial period ended around 11,700 years ago. To add a layer of confusion, there are also glacial maximums. A glacial maximum is simply the time in which ice sheets were at their greatest extent. These ice sheets lock up moisture which lowers sea levels and can dry up land. The last glacial maximum occurred between 26,000 and 20,000 years ago. During this time, the Sahara was even drier than it is today. The desert extended 500 miles or 800 kilometers farther south and farther north than today. Most of northern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula were practically uninhabitable. Archaeological remains from the Sahara during this time are nearly non-existent. Even long before the last glacial maximum, the Sahara may have already been abandoned. The last human presence recorded deep within the Sahara are 61,000 year old remains from the Tadrar Takakis Mountains in southwestern Libya. Africa in general was much drier than today. The monsoon belt in Africa was essentially restricted to the equator, where relatively small forests existed. The rest of Africa was savanna, grassland, or desert. Africa was already a very dry place 20,000 years ago and it didn't help that a Heinrich event occurred between 16 to 17,000 years ago. These events consist of a large number of icebergs breaking off into the North Atlantic which interrupts the thermohaline circulation patterns of the ocean. This causes extreme periods of seasonality which includes harsh winters and extremely dry summers. In Africa, due to the Heinrich event and the glacial maximum, Many larger lakes such as Lake Victoria or Turkana dried out. The White Nile, the part of the Nile that flows into Central Africa, had become merely a seasonal river. Even the mighty Nile itself was much weaker and may have been dammed by dunes seasonally. Africa remained a very dry place until the Heinrich event began to subside and the glacial period became less intense beginning around 15,000 years ago. Humidity returned to the Sahara relatively quickly. It would take about a millennium for water to saturate the region and for plant and animal life to move in. 
Lakes that had dried up thousands of years ago, such as Lake Victoria or Albert, overflowed, creating new bodies of water and streams. The Nile swelled to an all-time high, which likely impacted the inhabitants of the region and perhaps led to some flood myths. Lake Chad in the modern day is 1,500 square kilometers in size, but during the African humid period, it swelled to over 330,000 square kilometers. This is larger than nearly all of the Great Lakes combined and nearly the size of the current Caspian Sea. Such a massive amount of water came to the region from a much larger West African monsoon as well as from Mediterranean cyclones. This monsoon had already existed in dry periods and still exists today, but it grew much stronger due to changes in solar irritants and albedo changes. For an African humid period to occur, many complex climate processes must come together though it is not as rare as it may sound. Over the past 8 million years, over 200 of these African humid periods have occurred. The last period was just like any other, though it occurred at a quite significant time in regards to our species' existence. By 15,000 years ago, human cultures around the Mediterranean and the Near East were making significant advancements. The first truly sedentary cultures were forming such as the Natufian culture. The Natufian culture in particular appeared to have been ancestral to later agricultural societies. They hunted and gathered, though they also harvested wild grains which would later be cultivated. The return of moisture to not only North Africa but also areas around the Mediterranean certainly helped the inhabitants of these regions. The Sahara is significant in the larger picture because it had long been a barrier from Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa in the Middle East. But during this period, Vegetation spread over nearly the entirety of the Sahara. Most of the land consisted of grass-covered savanna with shrubs and trees. In such a large region, the vegetation did vary. The eastern Sahara was generally drier than the west. And of course, the land was much more lush around lakes and rivers. Along with vegetation, a diverse array of plants and animals moved into the region. Many familiar African animals such as elephants, giraffes, antelopes, baboons, wildebeest, and zebras were widespread throughout the region. Large herds of these animals expanded across the entire desert, though some were still limited to regions with more water. The appearance of aquatic animals such as crocodiles, hippos, turtles, and fish are a testament to how lush much of the Sahara was. Other carnivores such as hyenas, cheetahs, and of course human hunters also followed the herds into the region. Humans lived all around the Sahara and left a lot of evidence of their activities. Archaeology suggests that humans began to move into the greener Sahara as early as 15,000 years ago, though it would take some time for the environment to become welcoming. The people who moved into this region appear to have come from all around Africa, though many from sub-Saharan Africa. Prior to the African humid period, many African populations were still utilizing Middle Paleolithic stone technology. The greening of the Sahara allowed the spread of more advanced Upper Paleolithic stone technology to the rest of Africa. The populations that would come to settle the Sahara utilized a diverse array of technology. Many different styles of projectiles were made, some unifacial and many bifacial. Large stone axes, adzes, and knives were made. Thin circular discs of an unknown function are found at some Saharan sites. Some of them are quite refined and are a testament to the skill of these snappers. Other remains include many fish hooks and barbed points for spearing fish. Fishing appears to have been a very important part of their lives. Some sites have piles of thousands of fish bones. Many remains of portable art and jewelry were made from stone, bone, and ivory. Cave art and rock art were also a very important aspect of their culture. One of the original clues that the Sahara may have been green actually came from cave and rock art. One cave named the Cave of Swimmers has paintings of people which appear to be swimming along with other animals such as giraffe and hippopotamus. The paintings were discovered in 1933 by Hungarian explorer Lazio Almasi. He postulated in his 1934 book that the depictions in this cave may stem from real observations from the region. Though he was careful to state that it was not actually his opinion, considering it was quite controversial at the time. Nearly a hundred years later, it is quite reasonable to conclude that these people were actually swimming. These paintings date to around 10,000 years ago, a time when the region would have been lush. 
cave and rock art have actually proven to be a very important form of evidence of what these people were doing all those years ago. The first rock art in the Sahara was made roughly 12,000 years ago. Some rock art may date older, though human presence does not seem to have been too significant until this time. Called the Large Wild Fauna Period, hunter-gatherer societies depicted mainly the large animals from their environment. Familiar faces like elephants, rhinos, giraffes, and hippos, but also bovids like babulus and aurochs. Large and small antelopes can also be found in these works. Humans during this period are depicted sometimes naturalistically and other times as half-human, half-animal figures. Hunting scenes with spears and axes are common. Bows are absent from the art from this period, indicating that the technology either had not spread to the region or it was simply not used. Symbolic depictions are certainly known in this period and many animals have symbols covering them. What is interesting about this period is that it is relatively similar to the first art created elsewhere. Both in Europe and Asia, impressive animals were the focus of art long before humans were. It is hard to extrapolate why exactly this is. Many of these animals were hunted and therefore were directly tied to the existence of these people. Other animals may have simply been depicted because they were just inherently impressive. Whatever the case, the fact that large animals were some of the first things to be depicted in rock art may tell us something ubiquitous about the evolution of human culture. The large wild fauna period lasted from 12,000 to 6,000 years ago. Various subdivisions have been made based on different forms of art, though they are not as important for our purposes. This period of rock art roughly coincides with the onset of the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas was a temporary return to glacial conditions which began around 12,500 years ago. This period lasted roughly a thousand years and made northern latitudes much colder and drier. Saharan Africa appears to have been affected much less, though the Younger Dryas is correlated with drier conditions. Regardless, the Sahara still remained quite humid and human and animal populations continued to thrive throughout the Younger Dryas and afterward. Due to the popularity of pseudoscience in recent years, I find it necessary to mention that there was not an advanced civilization present in the Sahara during this time. All of our remains display that societies in the late Pleistocene and early Holocene Sahara were hunter-gatherers with many specializing in fishing activities. No monumental architecture or advanced technology has ever been found dating to this period. And no, a collapsed geological dome is not evidence that Atlantis was present in Mauritania. I can make a whole series about these lies told about the late Pleistocene, but for now just check out these videos from World of Antiquity. Anyways, Neolithic advancements such as agriculture and animal husbandry would not enter Saharan Africa until post 7,000 years ago. These advancements correlate to a change in rock art known as the Pastoral Period. As the name may suggest, this period features the appearance of domesticated cattle. Humans are shown herding domesticated animals, living in camps, as well as hunting. Along with these changes, the bow finally makes its appearance in hunting scenes. Both bow technology and, more importantly, animal husbandry are some of the most important inventions of the Neolithic. Domesticated cattle provided a food surplus that aggregate wealth and allow individuals to become socially distinguished. A significantly developed pastoral economy developed in southwestern Libya during this period. Animal husbandry became more common throughout the Sahara and spread to the rest of Africa. Bow technology was important for a number of reasons. It is not only an efficient weapon for hunting purposes, but also for war. War does not appear to have been very common in Neolithic Saharan societies, but it is important to mention. Human burial had been practiced across all of the African human period and often consisted of shallow graves, sometimes adorned with grave goods. During the pastoral period, the first stone monuments began to be made in the Sahara. Between 7,000 and 6,200 years ago, a tradition of creating piles of stone to bury individuals became common. These tumuli were often created far from actual sediments. Though they may not be as impressive as later Neolithic constructions, they still display quite a level of cultural complexity. This tradition of burial mounds may have even inspired the later Neolithic constructions in Egypt and elsewhere, though we will talk about this later. Towards the end of the pastoral period, Horses appear in some Saharan art. 
depictions of armed men on horses as well as horses drawn by chariots have been found. People are also depicted with clothing, instead of simply being naked. The last period of Saharan art is known as the Camel Period. This is of course because camels became more common in the region. Wild animals associated with the savanna appear less frequently, while animals associated with drier climates appear at a higher frequency. The desert expanded and much of the Sahara slowly became uninhabitable. Hunter-gatherer activities drastically decreased and were replaced almost entirely with pastoralism. Though, it became so dry that cattle could not withstand much of the Sahara. Sheep and goats were still able to thrive, though in mountainous or wetter regions. Along with a change in fauna, more advanced weaponry such as spears, shields, and metal axes appear in artwork. Many populations of humans and animals appear to have migrated to more hospitable regions. Importantly, many of these people appear to have moved along the Nile and played an important part in the founding of ancient Egypt. The burial mounds once made long ago in the Sahara may have directly influenced the creation of other African monuments, including pyramids. Though the end of the African humid period was disastrous for Saharan populations, the lower water levels actually helped humans settle along rivers. A similar process seems to have occurred elsewhere, such as in the Sumerian or Harappan civilizations. Some populations were able to remain in oases in isolated regions of the Sahara, such as the Caucasus Mountains. Sub-Saharan Africa was also heavily affected by the end of the African humid period. Forests contracted and the savanna expanded. The change in environment appears to have assisted Bantu-speaking populations in expanding. In Central and Eastern Africa, these climatic conditions aided in the spread of pastoralism along with pottery and other Neolithic technology. By the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age, the Sahara was similar in size as it is today. Since then, it has continued to fluctuate in size. The Sahel went through significant droughts between the 1970s and 1980s. This drought is very peculiar and unexpected. It may have been directly caused by the introduction of anthropogenic aerosols. These aerosols entered the atmosphere and created a hole in the ozone which affected sea surface temperature and subsequently precipitation in the Sahara. Since the Sahara has flipped from green and arid over 200 times in the past 8 million years, it will clearly happen again. Some climate models even suggest that the increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere may increase precipitation in the Sahara and facilitate plant growth. The Sahara may become green again sooner than expected with our influence. It is difficult to imagine how the climate will change with our activities because the forces that led to the last green Sahara are not the same as how we are affecting the environment. Some areas of Africa may become inhospitable, while some may become less arid and even lush. Direct geoengineering in the Sahara could play a large role in its future. Various methods could be used to increase vegetation and precipitation. Even large solar farms can decrease the albedo of the Sahara and trigger climate responses. But this brings up sort of an ethical question. Is green necessarily good? Should we strive to make every inch of the Sahara habitable? Clearly before human-caused climate change started, the Sahara was inhospitable. Should we strive to keep it in this state or to change it? If we were given the power or developed the technology, should we keep the Earth in its current conditions forever? With or without human-caused climate change, the Earth will change. And should we prevent this and keep the Earth in some snapshot of the environmental conditions that existed when we were raised? It is interesting to think about climate in this way. Clearly in the future we will have more control over the climate with our technology and these will be very important questions to consider in coming centuries. Despite how polarizing this topic can be, talking about it in this light can be quite refreshing. The Sahara has a fascinating history which has taught us how dynamic our planet really is. For thousands of years, lost people thrived in a lost land which we can only look at with nostalgia. Expansive lush landscapes only comparable to other regions in Africa are something I would really like to see someday. Well, thanks for watching the video. You may have noticed that the video output has significantly decreased, though I promise it is only temporary. As some of you know, I am studying abroad in Italy, which has brought many challenges regarding producing videos. It took me three weeks to even get a mic stand and get it set up, so yeah. I am still working on the Neanderthal project, and I will try to post more often. 
though, I will choose quality over quantity. Well, I'll see you on the next episode of North O2. Arrivederci.